Hi, my name is Daniel Kitts. I am a producer with The Agenda with Steve Aiken, and I'm talking today with Sanjana Hatotua. He is the founding editor of the uh, Sri Lanka website groundviews.org and is a senior researcher at Sri Lanka's Center for Policy Alternatives. And I'm talking today because um, this Saturday, September the 21st, in Toronto, he'll be taking part in the La Santa Wikramatunga Memorial Lecture uh, at Ryerson University. And the lecture will feature journalists from Canada and Sri Lanka uh, discussing the role of media in post-Civil War Sri Lanka. And if you're interested in finding out more, uh, you can go to the website slwb.ca. So that's basically slwb, as in Sri Lanka, Sri Lankans without borders, .ca. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, let's get started. Um, we, I just mentioned that you'll be at this uh, lecture in Toronto uh, later this week. Uh, tell me uh, what you want to uh, talk about and emphasize at the lecture. Uh, the lecture is uh, named after a senior editor in Sri Lanka who was uh, shot dead in broad daylight uh, in early 2009. It was the highest, one of the highest, if not the highest uh, profile killing of a journalist in, in, uh, in recent years. Uh, and it is to honor his memory uh, and his legacy to independent investigative journalism in Sri Lanka that I suppose Sri Lankans Without Borders thought of having an annual event, the first of which will be this Saturday. The event, myself included, will feature other speakers as well. I will be coming from Sri Lanka, the others are journalists either in exile or who have left the country for whatever reason. And we'll all be talking about, including uh, I think a Skype video chat uh, uh, connection with uh, another ed, a journalist from Sri Lanka, the situation regarding the freedom of expression in the country and media freedom post-war. It's four years after the end of the war and things are not looking good as they should be and could be. And it is our concern, uh, the challenges facing independent investigative journalism, the ongoing threats, the culture of impunity, the threats to the freedom of expression that we'll be focusing on, on and hopefully have some time to flesh out in more detail. Mm -hmm. What most concerns you about the media situation, uh, uh, the situation, excuse me, for journalists in Sri Lanka right now? You said at the beginning of the program that Sri Lanka was post-civil war, and if that is to be taken at face value, you would imagine that there would be a blossoming of the freedom of expression, even if there were legitimate reasons for the freedom of expression and independent media to be contained, controlled, and censored during the war, it follows, by extension of the logic that we are not at war anymore, that the media would be freer to operate and freer to say what they have and want to say. Unfortunately, that's not entirely the case. And even as recently as a few weeks ago, we find that journalists who are working on stories, even before reporting them, uh, have their houses broken into, uh, them being held at gunpoint with their children and family as well and are very lucky to escape alive. Uh, and it is this general culture of impunity. This is just one example. There are many more in the country, particularly in the north and the east, uh, which were ravaged by the war. Uh, journalists, media institutions and media personnel in those parts of the country have faced repeated attacks, including the media distribution channels. So in general, what we can say is that the attacks, the violence against independent media and journalists are occurring still very sadly in a culture of impunity where the rule of law is also very suspect and what that means quite simply is that any investigation, any meaningful investigation into these, uh, these violence and these attacks uh, don't really go anywhere uh, which gives rise to of course a vicious cycle where one creates the atmosphere and the context for that kind of violence to take place uh, in the future as well. So it's, it's fairly disturbing. Uh, the degree to which uh, self-censorship also uh, is an inevitable, invariable result of this kind of context. Now, you mentioned, obviously, that a lot of the um, incidents involving journalists have taken place in the North and the East, which, as probably most people watching uh, right now uh, know, um, is where the minority Tamil population is mostly concentrated and the Sri Lanka conflict has is complicated but in large part deals with uh, 
sort of a conflict between the majority Sinhalese population and the minority Tamil population. I was, I'm wondering, um, the problems you're seeing uh, with freedom of expression and with the ability to do good investigative journalism, is it mostly uh, focused on Tamil journalists or are Sinhalese journalists in other parts of the country also affected? It's both, in, but differently. Uh, Tamil journalists, not just in the north and the east, but because of their ethnicity and because of where they are reporting from and what they are reporting on, suffer a lot of violence. Uh, are the brunt, for example, of the army's pushback on stories uh, and articles uh, and uh, 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 content that seeks to flag and highlight, for example, the, the militarization in the north and the east, which is very at very, very disturbing levels and indeed increasing apace. On the contrary, and together with that, it doesn't really matter what ethnicity you belong to if you're reporting on issues of corruption, on militarization, on nepotism. Uh, there is, for example, a very interesting phenomenon where the all-powerful uh, Secretary to the Ministry of Defense, the President's brother, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, has never once been depicted in a cartoon ever since this government came into power. Uh, the President has, but this is an individual that you dare not, in a sense, uh, 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 caricature in a cartoon, and you then start to wonder why. Uh, why is that fear there? Why is that anxiety there? Uh, and so there are very fine lines but very clear and definite lines that you know when you've crossed irrespective of who, which ethnicity you are if you're a journalist or a, or a media person reporting on those individuals, those families, those issues, those areas, those institutions or those processes that uh, you risk pushback and that pushback is not just immediate but it also is quite violent in nature. Hmm. Now, the lecture you're going to be part of uh, this uh, Saturday, obviously, is an effort by some people in the Sinhalese and Tamil diasporas here in Canada to have some dialogue going about the situation in Sri Lanka. And, um, you know, I've found, I've done, one of the reasons I'm talking to you is that I've done a, a few programs over the past uh, four years about the situation in Sri Lanka, and so I've got to know some of the people in uh, the large Tamil community and the smaller Sinhalese community. And um, as a result, I've, I've gotten to know some of the opinions out there. And, and one thing I do know is that there's some very strongly held opinions uh, on both sides, um, uh, so very strongly held opinions sort of in the middle and very strongly held opinions on sort of two extremes of what the conflict was about and what needs to happen now. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, you know, how accurate are the widespread diaspora views on the reality in Sri Lanka? Do you find that when you talk to people on the outside that they are focusing on the right things, that they have a, a real appreciation of how things are, are going in the country? Uh, as you correctly pointed out, there's no, I mean, the diaspora is not one monolithic entity, so it, it, it really matters who you're speaking to, at what age, and when, and location. Uh, etc. But all that aside, I mean, at the same time, it must be said that the, the diaspora sometimes has very simplistic black and white views, uh, and you're you're left responding uh, to uh, some very uh, simplistic under uh, a very simplistic understanding of what the country is going uh, and undergoing today. Uh, on the other hand, there are also members of the diaspora who are acutely aware uh, of what things are on the ground and by virtue of being outside of the country can actually publish and air those views uh, more freely than uh, some of us within the country can uh, and, super, and, and obviously on some issues that uh, would be very very dangerous for us to uh, articulate any kind of opinion uh, around. So I suppose it's acting in concert with the, with the voices that are partial to a more nuanced understanding about what's happening on the ground and trying to clarify and meet as best as possible the more simplistic uh, understandings uh, within sections of the diaspora uh, and carrying out that conversation, keeping that conversation alive. Yeah. Fair enough. So, uh, I mean, you've already alluded to it a little bit, but is there any particular, again, with the understanding that the diaspora is not monolithic and, and different parts and different people have different things to contribute, but is there anything in particular you think the, the diaspora needs to do to help improve the situation in Sri Lanka? Because as you've said, they Deep, care deeply about the country, yet 
many of them, for various reasons, have been outside of the country for a number of years and might not be fully aware of, of how things are right now. The perspective of those outside of the country is useful, and it is always useful for us to understand, while we are within the country, how the world outside and the international community perceives that which goes on in the country. Uh, far too often, we have what is called the frog in the well con uh, uh, mindset, where we believe that governance within the country only ever resonates within the country uh, and doesn't uh, percolate into uh, international scrutiny. So it's always helpful to have uh, that international scrutiny, particularly from the diaspora. Negatively or positively, it doesn't matter. It helps to have eyeballs on the country. I suppose where the diaspora can help is keep Sri Lanka on the international agenda. Uh, if, I mean, particularly with the media then agenda, which is a very, very episodic. We are heading into the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Uh, so Sri Lanka is once more the synosure of media. You and I are having this conversation possibly because of the Chogam uh, in a few weeks' time. But once Chogam ends, then the media also moves on. Uh, and uh, this gives the space and the context for uh, the democratic deficit and challenges to the freedom of expression to grow in that sense. So I suppose keeping the pressure on uh, one's own domestic media in the diaspora to keep their focus in turn on Sri Lanka is very helpful so that we are always on the agenda, that the government always knows that somebody somewhere is writing a column, is doing a story, is doing an interview, is doing a video production, is doing a documentary, that Sri Lanka never is allowed to, uh, the government is never allowed to forget that the international media scrutiny is always there. And the diaspora can play a critical role in this by articulating their concerns, by getting people from Sri Lanka uh, onto the media agenda, not, like, not unlike what I'm doing with you, uh, by writing their own stories, by uh, bringing the stories of their family in the country, uh, out in their media. So there are a number of ways I think the diaspora can uh, 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 engage uh, with uh, the country's realities on the ground uh, and, and, and highlight those realities uh, through their own media in their countries to a broader international community. In, in terms of the broader international community, you've led me nicely to my next question. Um, again, I, we're saying this a lot, but it's, it's, it bears repeating, uh, with the understanding that, that the, the diaspora is not monolithic, you do get the sense from a lot of um, the Tamil diaspora here, a uh, feeling that uh, the international community, Canada, the United States, other countries, are not doing enough to pressure the Sri Lankan government. On the other hand, uh, from uh, some in the Sinhalese community, you get basically the argument, um, you know, we had a terrible civil war, it's over now, um, your countries have, you know, don't know what Sri Lanka is like, uh, you're guilty of your own human rights violations yeah. in your past, uh, yeah. keep your nose out, you know, we, you know, it's our country and you shouldn't be sticking your nose into something that you don't know anything about. So my question from that is, what constructive role between those two poles do you think the international community writ large uh, should uh, should bear to bring on the human rights situations that you talked about earlier? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't think I have the time to actually go into a detailed, uh, detailed answer, but I mean, you know, at the end of the day, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan government does not want to paint the country into a corner. If you take a look at the difference between the rhetoric that it articulates in Singhala within the country for consumption domestically and the tone and the substance and thrust of what it says to the international community, your government, the Americans, the European Union and the United Nations, there's a fundamental difference. Uh, and the rhetoric, the thrust of our diplomatic spiel in a sense is more reconciliatory. It's come look and see and then judge, whereas it's far more brutal, harsh and bordering on even hate sometimes in its domestic rhetoric in the Sobasha, in the vernacular. So there's a theory of schizophrenia operating there. What the international community can, I think, continue and must continue to suggest and very clearly 
highlight is that if Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan government wants to be respected as a, a, a member of the international community, it has to abide by some rules, by some basic standards of democratic governance. These are not set by your government or the British or the Americans. These are set by the United Nations, by, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So these are accepted universal norms of behavior and democratic governance that unfortunately the record suggests very very clearly is severely lacking in the country and one has a litany of examples where not just with the freedom of expression and media but with the rule of law with the, uh, 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 the with reconciliation post-war with the nature of development with the indignity still suffered by the Tamil people in the north and the east that things are not all right in the country and I think the international community must continue to impress upon my government that if it seeks to be respected in the international community then it certainly must abide by uh, uh, the norms of behavior uh, that uh, would, 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 would strengthen uh, in the eyes of the international community the respect that it, uh, that it seeks. Fair enough. Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, that was Sanjana Hatatua. He is the founding editor of the website uh, Ground Views, which is a very interesting citizen journalism site based in Sri Lanka. He's also a senior researcher at Sri Lanka's Center for Policy Alternatives. And as we mentioned at the beginning, he's going to be in Toronto at Ryerson University this Saturday, September the 21st, uh, to take part in the Les, excuse me, the La Santa Wikrama Tunga Memorial Lecture. Um, and uh, again, it will feature journalists, uh, including Sanjana and others from Sri Lanka and Canada, discussing uh, the uh, situation for journalists right now in that country. And as, as I said before, if you want to find out more about it, uh, go to the website slwb, as in Sri Lankans Without Borders, .ca. I'm Daniel Kitts. I'm with the Agenda with Steve Pakin, and uh, thanks very much for joining us.